Are you tired of being tired all the time? Welcome to episode 97 of the It's Not About the Alcohol podcast. We're going to discuss the real reason you can't sleep through the night. My guest today is Dr. Bajoy John, and he is the author of Why Nobody's Sleeping. He's a board certified sleep specialist and he's here to walk us through the seven steps you need to take to sleep now. My name is Colleen Cashman. I'm a sober-ish recovery coach, helping high-achieving women get emotionally sober so that drinking less or not at all feels like a superpower. Join me each week for evidence-based holistic strategies to regulate your brain chemistry and nervous system and also develop a growth mindset so you can feel proud, confident, and resilient with or without a drink in your hand because it's not about the alcohol. If you're drinking 10 or more drinks per week and know that your life would be better if you drank less, but you just can't seem to stop once you start, maybe the problem isn't that you just really love to drink. Maybe the problem is that you feel stuck and unclear about what your real purpose is in life because you've gotten so used to worrying about what other people think that you've forgotten how to feel and think for yourself. And you've gotten into the habit of using alcohol to relieve your stress and you've lost a sense of connection with yourself which means this isn't about the alcohol. And I can tell you that the only thing stopping you from drinking like a normal person is feeling like a normal person, someone who deserves better and is perfectly capable of doing better. Pause this episode and get in the show notes to register for my free training on my proprietary accelerated recovery process this Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern. I will lay out the roadmap, timeline, and the tools to change your relationship with yourself so that you can pursue happiness and mental health instead of sobriety, because happy people don't drink themselves into a stupor. And that's why I have decided to release my Foundations of Emotional Sobriety course, which I introduced when I did the launch for the new name of this podcast when we switched from Recover with Colleen to It's Not About the Alcohol back in November. As a gift for those of you that were around and joined my pod squad, I gave you access to a course I wrote and developed over the last six months called Foundations of Emotional Sobriety. And I originally designed it just for my clients, but it turned out to be such a good tool that I thought, you know what, I have to share this with the world. And so if you joined my pod squad, you got access to the course. But if you're not already one of my clients, it's kind of hard to get to because you have to log into my membership site and go through all of the modules and find what you're looking for. So... I decided to create a secret podcast because that's a cool thing. Everybody's doing it. And I'm loving some of the content that has been released by people I follow. So I wanted to see what it looked like to set that up. And we did it. Uh, We got it all set up and it's ready to go. So even if you signed up for the pod squad and you already have access, but you want to have access now in a private podcast feed, get in the show notes and find the link. The link is going to take you to my home page, which is just the front page of recoverwithcolleen.com. The first thing you're going to come to is a form that you can fill out to get the link for the podcast. I haven't figured out how to directly link it from the show notes to the private podcast. So there's going to be an intermittent step. You go to my website, you type in your email address, and then the link gets sent to your email. So we've got we've got the process all set out. There's just that extra step. Once you get connected, the Foundations of Emotional Sobriety secret podcast will show up in your podcast feed. Also in that email is the PDF workbook that goes with the program. And I highly recommend you do more than just listen. I created this course as more like a tool and you can go through it one time and consume the content. But if you really want to 
apply emotional sobriety in your life, the most helpful thing you can do is print out the workbook and then go through each module. They're like eight to 10 minutes with a specific problem or circumstance or life decision or whatever in mind and apply the tools to a specific circumstance. That's where you're really going to grow. The purpose of Foundations of Emotional Sobriety is to show you how to connect with your subconscious. And here's the thing, your subconscious is not all bad. It does hold your limiting beliefs, but it also holds your deepest desires. So you don't have to be afraid and flinch when you have subconscious feelings you don't understand. You know, your body is a library. It stores all of the memories and all of the lessons of the past, both good and bad. Your beliefs and desires aren't you. They're just beliefs and desires that you've formed or thought about in the past. And you can choose, just like a library, you can choose which books you read, which set of directions you follow. You can decide what your emotions mean and how to take actions in a way that align with your values and vision for the future. Your future is a blank canvas. It is not going to be a re repeat of the past unless you think it is. And so you can head into the future either consciously in spite of emotional baggage, or you can head into the future unconsciously without the awareness that you can become the cause of your life, of your happiness, or you can just live in the effect of what's happening in your mind and what's happening around you and become the victim of circumstance. And you probably wouldn't be listening to this podcast if you were going to pick plan B. So get into the show notes and get the link to my Foundations of Emotional Sobriety course. I'm calling it a secret podcast because I want to be cool, but it really is just a easy access version of the course. So even if you're one of my clients or you already have access, you just go through, sign up, and you'll it'll automate an email and you'll get right in and be able to listen right on your phone, right with all your other podcasts. So I hope you enjoy and do give me some feedback if it's working and if you like it because squeaky wheels get the grease, right? So if you like it, I might be motivated to do more. I'm just saying. And so let's dive into today's episode. I had such a fun conversation with Dr. Bajoy John. He's a sleep specialist and he wrote the book called Why Nobody's Sleeping. And I have to say that if I had to choose one self-care practice that I have learned from experience is not a pillar of health, but the actual foundation of health it's sleep. And similar to what I just explained with the concepts of emotional sobriety, you can either live as the cause to what's happening in your life, or you can live in the effect. The truth is that you are the cause of what's happening in your life. And the biggest mistake we all make, especially when it comes to sleep, is to just identify as somebody who has insomnia and then struggle to deal with the symptoms of, of insomnia instead of looking upstream and asking ourselves, why do we have insomnia? And then giving ourselves the opportunity to correct the behaviors that are actually causing us to be awake all night. And while it isn't any one thing, there are a lot of little things that really add up fast. You know, I am not like perfect about my sleep habits, which start from the moment you wake up. It begins with what time you wake up and how much sunlight you're exposed to and anchoring your circadian rhythm and eating at the right times of the day. You know, there's so many little things that go into it, but the biggest mistake that we all make is to expend our energy and our focus and our problem solving skills on compensating for last night's lack of sleep instead of expending our energy and focus and problem-solving skills on making sure we get a good sleep tonight. And so we end up in this sleep deficit cycle. And so we rely and create habits where we can't get going without caffeine. We're 
you know, reaching for sugary foods in the afternoons to keep going. And then we're chilling out in front of the television in the evening instead of maybe moving or doing reading a book or whatever. We're on our phones all day. So we just create this normal where it feels normal to be tired. And so we do all the things that tired people do instead of training ourselves to act like people who are well rested. And yeah, there's a period of time as you flip your approach where you're going to have to go without those crutches that are perpetuating the problem instead of solving it. But I tell you what, you know, I quit drinking four years ago. And y'all know, if you listen, I have reintroduced alcohol. I have a glass of wine every now and then, but obviously it's not at all like I used to. It's not a habit. I don't overdo it. I have one or two glasses at the most occasionally which just shows there's a lot of wiggle rooms in your daily habits. You know, you don't have to live perfect and get up at the exact same time every day and go to bed at the exact same time every night and, you know, never be on your phones. Like, it's not about living perfect. But once I got rid of the biggest problem, which for me was daily alcohol, which was keeping my cortisol levels sky high and causing me to wake up every night and blocking my REM sleep, once I changed that, I feel like a snowball started to form that was rolling down the correct hill that I actually wanted to be on. And four years later, I have gone through menopause without struggling with insomnia and hot flashes. I don't have sugar cravings. I mean, I'm a person. Sometimes I don't sleep well, right? Sometimes I I crave things I shouldn't have. But for the most part, doing what I needed to do to correct my sleep you know, not making this about the alcohol, but really focusing on what is it that's creating my quality of life and focusing all of my efforts to making sure I am a well-rested woman and then letting my habits and behaviors fall in line with that. That's the best investment I've ever made. And I tell you what, this sleep issue is the reason why it's not normal to be healthy. I believe you have to make a choice. Do I want to be normal and have something to bitch about with everybody else when everybody's talking about all of the problems, whether it be weight gain or whether it be tired and exhaustion and stress and burnout, or whether it be autoimmune disorders or chronic illness or inflammation and pain and migraines and all of that, like everything leads back to being well rested. And so my guest today has written a book, Why Nobody's Sleeping, and it's a great book. And he's got this super cute, well-played acronym called Sleep Now. So S-L-E-E-P-N-O-W. He goes through all of the steps. And you guys, it is not huge. Like there are things you can do right now, beginning with understanding that you need to focus more on tonight's sleep than compensating for the lack of sleep last night. And you just have to embrace the suck for a minute while you let yourself be naturally tired enough to actually fall asleep and get a good night's sleep. And I tell you, it will reward you. It will be the best thing you ever do. So enjoy the episode. I want to welcome you, Dr. John, to the show. I'm so excited for this conversation because as we talked before we started recording, I personally believe sleep is not one of the pillars of health, it is the foundation. And when you start to work on correcting sleep and sleep problems that everything else, including addiction, including diet and metabolism, and including mental health issues and including autoimmune, like everything, gets better when you sleep better. And you are a board certified practicing sleep specialist with lots of experience. You've also written a book called Nobody's Sleeping. And so I'm excited to welcome you to the show. Will you introduce yourself to my listeners? Thanks, Colleen. It's a pleasure to be on your show. I appreciate the introduction. I'm Dr. Bijoy John. I've been practicing for over 25 years, taking care of folks with various sleep problems. Sleep is the superpower, right? Like you said, once you sleep, you can conquer the world, right? We can heal. You know, there's a strong correlation between anxiety and depression and poor sleep. It's a vicious cycle. Same with diet. You know, your hormones are all out of whack when you don't sleep well. We, When we sleep, we heal. We're able to make better choices. People, you know, try 
different things uh, and get addicted to themselves hurting themselves but my 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 aim is to heal the world by teaching how to ple- you know sleep better i've written a book and also have a course in the works so my passion this is my passion i'm going to you know i've dedicated my life to this thing and i think your listeners hopefully will benefit from uh, our conversation today i'm ready colin when you are Before we dive into strategies and before we dive into actual specific action items people are going to want to take, can you just answer the question that is the title of your book? (laughs) Why is nobody sleeping? All right. So I I was in a big practice. My background is ICU. I was the ICU uh, pulmonary doctor. I also practice sleep. So my sleep practice was not, you know, growing because my priority was in the ICU, critically ill patients. But then I work in the ICU, I'm seeing a lot of these problems are tied to poor sleep, like blood pressure and this complication, stroke, atrial fibrillation, obesity. You know, as life goes, we all have our priorities. I said, instead of reacting to these problems, I want to make a difference. I want to change the world by teaching people. So I came out and started my own clinic that dedicated 100% to uh, sleep problems. And then I, everybody who's walking in has the same problem. So this is, I call it the new pandemic. The real reason I think is the society and the culture we live in, we take in a lot of worries, especially the use of uh, the cell phone. And I call our new best friend. We spend hours, including myself and all of us spend a lot of hours on this new best friend. And where is that time coming from? It's from your sleep. So people are are sleeping less. If you look, for example, if you sleep one hour less every day for a week, you lost one whole night. So you're operating in a sleep debt. The sleep debt manifests into different things in in an everyday uh, life. People call in sick. It's it's like over $470 billion or or 2.7% of the GDP has been affected because of people calling in, you know, uh, late or don't want to work. You're in a bad mood. You know, you have uncontrolled blood pressure. You have uncontrolled diabetes. You know, if you have symptoms of anxiety or depression, that gets, you know, that gets worse. How did we get there? I think it's a prolific, one cause, identifying cause is a prolific use of our cell phones, you know, and especially the light from the cell phone is telling our brain, especially if you use it in your bedroom, that's still daytime. And of course, all the other package it brings in with the anxiety, the likes that we're worried about the likes and all the information, misinformation that is working on our mind. So I have this, you know, way to work this. So to answer the question, why are we here? This because of the culture we live in, the geopolitics, you know, status, and also the use of our cell phone is the one cause that we're not sleeping well. You know, it brings to mind when you talk about working in the ICU, Mm -hmm. having had family members in hospital, in addition to cell phones, I think it's also a culture Mm -hmm. where sleep is not recognized as the highest priority. Anybody who's ever spent the night in the hospital, I have myself and my blood pressure cuff is waking me up Mm -hmm. every hour Mm -hmm. and the dings on the machines Mm -hmm. I've spent before my mother-in-law passed away multiple nights staying with her in the hospital, nobody's sleeping. Correct. Nobody is sleeping. Yes. And the staff is not is trained to interrupt sleep yeah. because getting your vitals in the middle of the night is somehow more important than the actual sleep. Can you speak to why the sleep is not recognized as the highest priority Correct. even in our healthcare system? Good question, Colleen. Sleep problems don't hurt like a toothache or it doesn't grow like cancer. We actually, if you have a toothache, we're going to take care of it right there and then because it is hurting us. But sleep problems affect us over a long periods of time, five, 10 years. So we are not recognizing the effect of sleep, especially in the ICU and the hospital we have something called delirium. You know, that's one of my interests in, in the ICU too. People are delirious because we wake them up all the time. You know, the blood pressure curve, the labs. Of course, when you're critically ill, you do. And, you know, to a point that we kind of created a safe zone or not disturb between 12 and 4, avoid that 2 a.m. blood pressure in the you know, patients on the floor, 
and the regular four. I think that's a thing that we worked on. Very good point. You know, delirium is, you know, is a major problem. To answer the question, sleep problems are you know, affects you in the long run. It, you know, it does not have an instant problem. But we all know a 10 years of sleep problem will get you really good. Yeah. I know personally, yes. you know, I can do one night mm-hmm. of reduced sleep. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to call in sick. Yes. But by the time I get two or three nights piling yes. up, to me, it's I don't have time to not deal with this. Correct. This has to become my highest priority because I can see the quality of my thoughts, the quality of my focus, the quality of my mood, my energy, all of that goes down. Can you talk about what people do not understand about sleep that keeps them from prioritizing it? Because what is it doing for us? Correct. If you have an infection, you will have a fever. You know, there is a marker for, you know, for that. If you have a lung infection, you'll be coughing. There are symptoms, but sleep problems you know, the, what is the problem? Like you mentioned, you're tired all the time. So what do people think? Hey, maybe I'm tired from a vitamin deficiency, but you know, but you're actually tired because you're not getting the deep sleep. So that's one of the, there is no telltale signs. You can detect a person from far away. They have raccoon eyes because sleep affects your skin, you know? So it affects, you know, you're restless. You're not, you know, your cognition, you don't make those good decisions, but it is affecting us on our daily basis but imagine if you feel well rested you are in a great mood that extra one hour you get that is you know you feel better so i want everybody to feel that way every day so that's my aim in life so let's talk a little bit about how it's very normal Mm -hmm. to be tired people think that's just normal Mm -hmm. and that the solution Mm -hmm. to being tired is coffee. Yes. And I don't want to demonize coffee, yeah. but I did hear a tip. I think it was Dr. Andrew Andrew Huberman. He has a podcast on and he did sleep mm-hmm. and he was saying that you should delay your first cup of coffee 90 minutes to let your body wake up and that if you are tired be, if you're drinking coffee because you're tired, that's not a coffee deficit. That's a sleep deficit. Exactly. And so now I'm very careful to you know, if I have a cup of coffee mid morning or something, it's because I'm enjoying yes. it. It's not because I need it to keep going. Can you talk about the cycle of sleep deficit and the reliance on coping mechanisms that allow you to keep going and how that actually undermines your even awareness that sleep is an issue? Great question. So seven o'clock in the morning, we are at our brightest because you've slept from 10 to six, you're ready to go. To to mark that point, if you're reaching out coffee at 7 a.m., you have a sleep debt. You should be refreshed, ready to go. If you want to enjoy coffee, it's actually good for you. You should, if you drink coffee like about 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and remember at two o'clock in the afternoon, we are tired because of our circadian rhythm. That's where the whole world stopped. In in the British countries, we uh, we all drink tea. It's called tea time. People, uh, uh, you know, stop. Or it's a siesta, uh, you know, for a nap. If you have coffee around the time, that's normal. But 7 o'clock in the morning, if you're reaching for your coffee, that is you're operating under a sleep debt. Very well fact. And also a word of caution, coffee lasts about 4 to 6 hours, but in vulnerable people, Coffee can, the effects of caffeine can last up to 12 hours. So if you're not sleeping well at night, I tell people not to drink coffee past 1 p.m. So let's just put ourselves in the lifestyle of somebody who believes that they can't sleep. So they're staying up too late on their phone. Mm -hmm. That is one of the things with clients that I deal with that I can't sleep. So I'm texting or I'm watching the show and it's okay. No, you can't sleep because you're doing that. So we've got people who believe that I can't sleep anyway. So they give up on the sleep and then they're using stimulants to get throughout the day. Talk to me about how to interrupt that cycle. What does that look like? And even then, what are the results? How quickly does it take to be able to sleep? Because if you feel like you can't sleep, that's legit. And it it actually can get into your mind Mm -hmm. and that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy and you get anxiety about the sleeping. Where does somebody start to correct these cycles? Perfect question. As we go into my strategies, sleep 
is a work in progress. It's not an easy. The easy answer will be to take a pill or drink alcohol to go to sleep, but that's not, you can't fulfill for a long time. I tell people, teaching a good habit, especially sleep, will take at least four to six weeks, right? The first step is called a sleep schedule. I have the seven proven sleep strategies. It's called sleep now, S-L-E-E-P, N O W. We will start going through that since you you know asked the, that leading question. So the first is called the sleep schedule, right? So we have to win to do anything in our life. We have to have a plan. So the right time to sleep is between ten to ten p.m. to six a.m. So let's say you you went to bed at ten and you're not able to fall asleep by midnight. Most people what they do they either go to bed earlier like 9 p.m. So now you're struggling for three hours. So I tell people, if you're only able to fall asleep by midnight and you go to bed close to that time, you go to bed at 11.30 p.m., all right? But make sure you wake up at 6 in the morning, right? This is the, it's called sleep restriction. It works great, but you have to have that. So then, so then the next strategy is the low temperature. So this is the L in the acronym, low temperature, low light, low noise. So the low temperature and especially the low light is so important because melatonin, the hormone that puts us to sleep that's available in plenty within us, it's only secreted in darkness. Melam is dark. So melatonin is only secreted in dark and also in colder temperature. So I tell people to experiment between 65 to 70 degrees to see. And also, of course, noise is, you know, affects your brain waves. So of the two, that's most important is low light and low temperature, right? Uh, go ahead. So I want to just reflect what I heard there yes. just to tease it out mm -hmm. so the audience can really get it. Mm -hmm. Starting with the first one, the sleep schedule, mm -hmm. what I heard you say is that even if you can't get to sleep, yes. to go ahead and get up at the 6 a.m. time, Correct. you know, and I'm sure there's some reason there, yes. like I get up at 30 yes. or whatever, but what I'm hearing you say is that you have to pay on the front end with and be tired, allow yourself to be tired. Correct. So that then it will correct the next day. Yes. As opposed to what my teenage daughter likes to do is I can't sleep. I was up all night and then she wants to sleep until two or three in the afternoon yes. and then she can't sleep the next night. So the first one, the most important thing I'm hearing is that you need, it's more of the wake time that you need to focus on. Absolutely. Making that consistent. You got and that. And then eventually the, the go to bed time will be feeling more natural as your circadian rhythm gets anchored in that waking time. Correct. That's very important. Then the other thing I heard you say with low temperature, this has been a game changer for me. Yes. When I wake up in the middle of the night, I no longer think to myself, oh, I can't sleep and let my brain get on some horse of anxiety and run around the pasture. Mm -hmm. I normally think, oh, I am warm right now. I have woken up because my room is too warm. Mm -hmm. And so I will get up and I will change, you know, I will open the window or I will adjust the thermostat or whatever. So properly diagnosing not sleeping to be temperature, like for me, I am shocked at how my inability to sleep is almost always a product of temperature. Whereas if I hadn't noticed that or read that and did the work, I would have never been able to diagnose that. But waking up, especially a woman, menopause, that it is my the temperature of my body that is keeping me from staying in that deep sleep. Yes, that's a I mean, valid point. Uh, let me touch on the first point that you made. Six o'clock wake up is perfect because you're trying to create a sleep that eventually you can change things, but at least you can only change once you do that for about two weeks. Great uh, uh, noticing the point and reiterating that. All right, coming back to the temperature, you know, women's uh, sleep is so nuanced. So I dedicate a chapter for women's sleep in my book. So because it's so many factors, hormonal changes every month. And then menopause is hard on women. You know, women gain weight. You know, you're at risk for sleep apnea around that time. And the temperature changes. So comfortable clothes is very important. And also, see, for example, if you take a trip to a, temp, you know, a tropical place, you see your sleep is bad there because your melatonin is not secreted. So people in colder weather actually sleep better. All right. That's that leads into the next the E in the acronym 
is no electronics. You know, I cannot reiterate enough, especially if you use your cell phone in the, you know, our, we are bringing work to our bedroom. The light from the phone and the computers, especially without ambient light in the bedroom, is telling our brain, hey, it's just daytime. You know, there's no need to sleep and the melatonin will not secrete. So I tell people, how do you get rid of this is I, I tell everybody, to have a cell phone free zone. So first you have to recognize you have a cell phone addiction. If you wake up in the morning and you're reaching out to the phone, the first thing, that means you have a cell phone addiction. Let's all accept it. We all have it. But then on the back end, I tell people not to use your cell phone at least an hour prior to going to sleep, right? For many reasons, yeah. the light, the anxiety, you know, you don't want sleep anxiety. You know, people are so anxious to sleep. They're called sleep anxiety. I'm trying to de-addict people. And also, keep your cell phone away from you. In, in my own practice, I keep my cell phone in my bedroom. I set an alarm for this morning, 6 o'clock, and I've literally wake up and go and turn it off. I don't have all the dings, the notification, the alarms, whatever. And also, I don't have a clock in my bedroom because we all wake up in the middle of the night. And once you look at, oh, my God, it's only 2 o'clock. Oh, it's 2 o'clock. I have only 3 hours to sleep. That works on your cognitive activity. So I set an alarm. So I know my alarm will ring at six and I'm done. So that's the E in the uh, acronym. Go ahead. One thing I want to highlight, I speak to so many people who are still not even cell phones. They've got TVs on yes. and they're leaving TV yes. on while they're trying to sleep and then wondering why they can't sleep like that right there, like low hanging fruit. Yes. Knock that off. Yes. But I do want to share a personal reflection mm -hmm. I will keep my phone in my bathroom. Yes. And then, of course, sometimes mm -hmm. I get out of the habit of doing that. Mm -hmm. And what I notice yes. is that when I am regularly keeping my phone in my bathroom, you sleep I wake up before my alarm. Yes. So I will wake up right around that time because that's what we tell ourselves, yes. right? That I need the phone by me because I have to set my alarm. Yes. When your sleep is properly functioning, mm -hmm. you actually wake up naturally. Correct. And the more I keep my phone in my bathroom, yes. the more I do not need, I'm up before my alarm. Mm -hmm. And then the more I keep it by my bed, you know, there's one more thing I have to check. I do sense that low grade anxiety of, oh, I need, mm -hmm. and it's, I feel like a junkie yes. twitching in my bed, mm -hmm. like, oh, I got to check or I got to look. And when I put it in my bathroom, I really notice that urge where my brain, it's just a subconscious thing. Like you said, it's an addiction. Yes. Addiction is just a subconscious habit. Mm -hmm. It's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. You can break it, mm -hmm. but putting your phone away from your bed and just watch your brain get a little crazy. But then as you said, within two weeks or so that your sleep adjusts, yes. like what would it be like? I never would have believed I could wake up without an alarm. Yeah. And there are nights I don't even remember to set one and I wake up on time i'm not late yes your body is so amazing it adjusts you know same anecdote and a practical it was 1999 the gore versus bush, bush election i had the tv in my bedroom i was watching it and watching it i couldn't sleep the whole night and that's when i realized this is a problem i was also in you know i'm as a sleep specialist i took the TV out the next day. And ever since then, for the last 20, almost 25 years, I've not had a TV in my bedroom. I preach it to my, you know, my, all my clients and my patients who come and see me and my own family. So no TV because nothing good comes on TV, right? It's all, and, and the light, you know, the light from the TV is also uh, affecting. So we'll move along to the next E in the acronym. You ready? Yes. So the next E is exercise right when we exercise we release endorphins and cortisol these are stimulants so i tell people you know this is this is the process of calming your body as you're getting ready to bed so exercise i tell people i exercise at least four hours prior to going to sleep so the ideal time to exercise is in the morning you're you know ready to go so i exercise in the morning but if you have to exercise in the evening make sure you exercise at least four hours prior to you know bedtime so that you, your body is the, the endorphin stimulation is not there and also when you exercise your temperature is high remember the low temperature when the core body temperature is higher you know, you your melatonin is not secreted, and also I'll make one more little point about diet. We might have we might talk about diet and uh, and sleep. So when you eat a large meal, you are consuming a lot of energy to digest that. That also increases our core body temperature. That also affects our sleep. All right. So now we are going to the P in the acronym. So it's called powering off your mind. 
So you have to do S L E E to get to P, right? So you already calmed your body a little bit, gave your mind a rest by not having your phone by you or looking at the emails and all that stuff. So now powering off, I use two tech two two techniques which are well proven method. These are all my own techniques I've been using. One is called vivid imagination. So instead of you know when you lay in bed you don't want to worry about the real problems. I want to use your imagination to create your own story of the show that you watched or some other. You want to be the director of that story. I use it every night and it works great. Vivid imagination is there, but nobody else uses it to sleep. It's a very practical tool. I, you know, if I watch the show that day or, you know, I want to see how that story unfolds in my own head. So I'm the director and I start thinking about that and it works every time vivid imagination for sleep i'm the first guy to do it and it works and it's a great technique instead of worrying about real problems you're using your imagination to create your own beautiful dreams and your thought process and the next strategy to power off your mind is called yoga nidra right yoga is a very powerful way the nidra means it's a sanskrit it's a deep word it's called nothingness you have to be nothing it's a very easy technique and tell everybody to lay down on the back and spread your arms like a corpse. It's called the corpse pose and think about something of nothingness. Think about nothing. So you're already in this process. So you've done your imagination you and now you just think and then you will drift off into sleep so beautifully. So that's called yoga nidra, N-I-D-R-A. You don't need a coach to learn. It's a very simple technique what I ta- taught you right now. And beyond that, I know this goes against the phone thing, yes. but we're all doing human stuff here. Yes. Sometimes if I'm traveling which is when I tend to struggle with sleeping. Yes. There's yoga on YouTube mm-hmm. and yoga nidra, the, the way I've experienced, it's just a very gentle guided awareness through your body. Mm-hmm. Like you pay attention to your toe. I can do it without the, without somebody guiding me through. But if you don't understand what yoga nidra is, perhaps use your phone, you know, that to, to go through some of that. But what I'm hearing with the visual or vivid imagination, as well as the yoga nidra, it's softly directing your consciousness so that your brain has something to do. Because I think this idea that we can't can't think, then now I'm thinking about thinking, like that's crazy. But directing your focus a little bit to a non-anxious, non-real life thing, like how does my big toe feel right now? Can I feel it in space? Can I feel the cover on it? And then you just allow your brain to have a focus and then it does amazing. Like the yoga nidras that I have done on YouTube and you can just search yoga nidra, there'll be scripts that come up, but they are powerfully i never have gotten through a whole one where i didn't fall right asleep yeah so that is you know progressive muscle relaxation technique also you focus on different parts of your body and then try to relax each group so that also works great all right so i tell people bedroom is for sleeping and sex but most people are either snoring or worrying so now i'm going to go to the no it's that i've combined those two words it's called no to worries, right? So you should never worry in bed. I want people to worry, but I use this in my own life. I worry between 6 and 8 p.m., all right? So anything I need to do, I do it around that time. I write it down the things that I cannot do so I can focus on, you know, tomorrow. I got to get on Colleen's show tomorrow, so I take care of everything, I prepare everything, and I'm done by 8 o'clock, all right? So I don't, if I don't, I just send it up for the next day. I write it down. So this is a great technique. So no to worries. But worry, we, we all are born to worry, but worry between 6 and 8 p.m. And you're getting ready between 8 to, you know, 10 o'clock. You know, it's like a, you know, a sleep is like a, it's a slow process. Uh, it's a, it's like a grand meal. It's a seven course meal. You have to wine, music, wine, you know, appetizers, salad. You don't have to go to the big piece right away. So that's the process I want everybody to think. So you've all done that. So no. And then the last is W is win by losing yourself keeping your bedtime rituals very simple sleep is one uh, one phenomenon in our life that you can go and get it 
sleep is remember this is the most important uh, point i teach everyone sleep is like a dimmer it's not an on off switch we cannot do that guys this is one thing you have to ease into it but when you do sleep well you can be all during the day right seven to seven you can be at your best and then start preparing so this is like a cycle but we are falling to the negative cycle so this is my sleep now acronym this is my own uh, proprietary technique which i you know combine all the other techniques so the, how it goes is schedule your bedroom environment you know calm your body calm your mind no to worries and let it go win by losing and that's the seven proven sleep strategies my daughter who's in law school she said dad you need to have an acronym so i came down with a you know sleep now acronym so it's an amazing acronym yeah. i'm always looking for a good an acronym yes. and i gotta say played yes. on sleep now yes, that yes. is beautiful yes you know i wanted to just reflect what i heard about the no worries yes and as a woman who is highly productive and i've had all the kids and doing all the things and often what as women we hear ourselves say nobody's going to give me a break nobody can i just get a break and what we need to tease apart and really reflect on is that when you're laying in bed worrying or thinking you're the one who's not giving you a break correct and this is one of the cognitive just little things that i do where i catch myself in thoughts and i'm like oh the only thing i have to do right now is feel my feet and listen to my heartbeat mm -hmm. or tune into my breath whatever that's my job and that's going to get my whole focus i think so much of our modern society it's not just cell phones as johan hari's book stolen focus talks about we've lost our ability to concentrate on one thing at a time and we think we're multitasking when in fact we're just bouncing all over and so i love to tell myself at night this is the break you've been waiting for Correct. all damn day yes so even if you're not sleeping yes that's fine lay here and listen to the fan or listen to you know the hum of the air conditioner or whatever it is and we have to say i'm willing to give myself this break and if you only put boundaries in eight hours of your day you know, one third of your life, you've got good boundaries. This is my time. Exactly. This is my Take time. it. It's free. It's there to be taking. Let's go. <laughs> so, yeah. You're not doing anything anyway yes. when you're laying there worrying yes. or whatever. Yes. So. You know, you touched on a few other things. I think uh, I'll also talk about the weight problems with not sleeping well. So when you sleep well, you know, the regulation of the hormones called leptin and ghrelin is in good order you know the leptin is the hormone that uh, helps us to uh, curb our appetite ghrelin was the you know the hormone that increases appetite so when you sleep well this is in good shape but when you are not sleeping it is altered so we have less leptin and more ghrelin you are going to be more hungry and also just for a simple fact the more time you are awake the more chance to eat and wh what happens when you're tired you make wrong choices you go for the high glycemic index food like a chips or a candy uh, or a sweet drinks or soda so what happens those things actually even if you consume it four hours prior to sleep you're going to affect your quality of your sleep so that's the thing i want to focus and of course when you don't sleep you gain weight when you gain weight you have other sleep problems like sleep apnea so that's a separate you know problem that we're going to have can you just, for the listener, mm -hmm. share one of your biggest uh, success stories, a case study of someone who put their energy into healing their sleep and then how that changed their life? So this is day in and day out, Colleen. I see patients every day and I give them, you know, I also tell everybody to maintain a sleep log, which I'll have on my website here real soon. It's uh, My website is www.sleepfixacademy.com. So I, I make everybody fill those and then they see the mistakes they're making when they're drinking the coffee, when they're taking a nap, when is they're, they're drinking the alcohol, so they are able to visualize it. So many success stories, and when they just recognize, you know, I have I had a client who, who was drinking a lot of alcohol closer to bedtime and to go to sleep. You know, it was four drinks, five drinks, six drinks. But you know, 
when you drink alcohol, it's an anesthetic. It puts you to sleep, but alcohol metabolizes into something called acetaldehyde, which wakes you up. And also alcohol is uh, diuretic. You also wake up to a pee. So one other a little strategy I tell people not to drink too much you know, fluid towards closer to bedtime so that you don't pee, literally wake up to pee. So many stories, the one that was, was a young man, you know, I gave him this schedule and he was able to see, oh, and then he was taking like two naps later in the day completely. So he, I gave him the schedule. He was able to cut down on his alcohol, cut down on his caffeine, a few things. He was a young man. He was only 26 years old. He has his whole life ahead of him. So this is one was last week. He was able to change his uh, life when he bought those things back and he was able to sleep. He was, a, he was only sleeping four hours. At this time, he was able to sleep six hours now. He's about uh, two, four weeks into this program. So that uh, just came off my head head about that one success story but this is day in and day out i see folks who have been successfully transformed i don't i'm more into holistic i don't give medicines but i have if i have to i do but that's not my the easy answer is to teach people or find their strength it takes time but the easy answer is a pill which i'm not a huge fan of yeah as a daily drinker mm -hmm. I look back now and realize that so many of my problems, yes. alcohol was a problem, yes. but what the real problem was is I was exhausted. I wasn't getting the REM sleep. Okay. Yes, I was passed out, yeah. but I was waking up anxious and it was just a snowball rolling down the wrong yes, hill. Yeah. And I often work with women and I'm like, what if your goal, instead of getting sober or quitting drinking, like what if your goal was to maximize your sleep? then you have this greater goal, yes. this value of yours. This is really important to me. And it's easier to adjust your behavior when instead of saying, I have to quit drinking because I have a problem with alcohol mm -hmm. and saying, no, I'm working on my sleep right now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can't have any alcohol past 7 p.m. because, you know, that would then wake me up in the middle of the night. And it is so true. Alcohol, even when I have one glass of wine, I can notice, even if I don't wake up, I notice my sleep feels a little bit lighter. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's okay. Yes. You know, I can have a glass of wine. Yeah. It's not a problem. Yeah. But right now I perceive sleep to be my highest priority. health That's priority. a superpower. <laughs> it's a superpower. Yes. The next revolution yes. will be led by well-rested women. Correct. And when you adjust your value, your goal, your end goal to be a well-rested woman, yes. it's so much easier correct. to correct the behavior. Yes. So my aim is to create this sleep revolution. You know, I want to feel the joy that I feel. You know, I mean, I had my own shares of struggles as in medical school and when I lost my mom and I started my practice, but I know how to get back into the saddle and take control but that's a fundamental is it's a grind it's so you can go off here and there holidays coming you know my kids want to hang i'm ready to hang you know pop's got this but, but pop's gonna be ready too you know so i take you know i encourage naps 15 to 30 30 minutes nap right around the afternoon, 2.30 when our body is kind of in a lull. Uh, so I've covered all these chapters in my book for children. I'm, I'm very focused on children and, you know, and teens and also have chapter for older adults. I have chapter for, you know, women. I have chapter for athletes. I call it the third quarter slum. My favorite team does not play well in the third quarter. Nobody has looked into it. I'm the first guy because you're tired. 2.30, you cannot cheat your body. Have you ever gone to a meeting at 2.30? No. Because you were running to 7 a.m. meetings and also 7 p.m. is the time that the TV people call it prime time because that's where when you are at your peak alertness, right? So we, we do things without knowing why we're doing it. And then, but if you can just tweak your body's own superpower and kind of have a schedule and do the things I told you were ready, uh, let's go. So. Sleep is a superpower. Get that. Okay, so Dr. Yes, John, yes, your book um, is called Nobody's Sleeping. So that's Sleeping. my effort. Yes. Okay. So your book is called Nobody's Sleeping, and Correct. it's available everywhere. And uh, you want to say anything else about that or where the listeners can find more with you? Yes. I have this in a book. You know, it's being printed, but it's, you know, the publisher sees so much demand. They call it crashing the book. It was supposed to be released in July, but they are working hard to release it in February. So the CEO had to fly in, come and say, this is a, this is an amazing book. We need to get it to the hand. So uh, just go ahead and, you know, it's available to pre-order now. And so I also have my own, uh, you know, uh, place where, every, you know, 
I want to help more people. It's called www.sleepfixacademy.com where I'll have my you know, sleep course, a lot of resources, my podcasts, all will be available to, to learn. Uh, you know, uh, when you sleep, you heal. When you heal, you can do a lot more. Uh, that's my aim in life, uh, Colleen. That's my mission. Let's create the sleep revolution. <laughs> yeah. Did I hear you say you have a podcast? I, I think I didn't know that. Yeah, I have a recorded podcast that I I don't have a, a live podcast. Now I'm a guest on a lot of podcasts, but I do re record a few of my own podcasts on my website that I mentioned. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. John. Colin, it was a pleasure and good luck to all your uh, listeners and viewers. Thank you. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. I did put Dr. John's information in the show notes so you can go to his website, sleepfixacademy.com. His book is there. It's also on Amazon. Highly recommend it. And then if you're not following me on social media, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook at Recover with Colleen. I'm doing a little bit on the TikTok and you can find me there at It's Not About the Alcohol. So stay connected with me there and DM me your comments or feedback or your questions. I really appreciate hearing from you, especially when a topic resonates or if there's a way I can expand or go deeper into a subject. Um, again, squeaky wheels get the grease. And so when I hear from you, I get real motivated for what I'm creating for next week. So reach out to me. And then if you want to stay connected with me on email, I send out a weekly email about these podcasts, usually dive a little deeper into my story or some other content. And then I also keep you updated on upcoming events that I have. Like this month, um, next week, I'm doing a storytelling workshop as well as a breathwork workshop. And while these experiences are free for my clients, you can also pay a small drop-in fee and come and join us. And I tell you what, the storytelling workshop is fabulous. And when you pay the drop-in fee, you also get access to all of the the three-part workshop that I did back in October and November. And so you can get way more information than like what we cover in the one hour workshop, we actually bring in storytelling and you get to work through an issue with the storytelling process. But there are three uh, workshops prior to this one that you can listen to me teach about the power of storytelling, teach about the psychology of trauma and story and how we can heal the past and the future by doing storytelling work. And so I encourage you to sign up for that because you do get so much more than just the one workshop. You also get access to the other ones as well as a workbook. So get in the show notes, click on the link for my insider email uh, list and subscribe, and then you will be up to date. And I hope to get to meet you at some point. I really appreciate all of you that are listening, especially if you're still listening, like you're one of my people, right? And I would also appreciate if you shared the show in some way, whether it be forwarding the email, if you're getting the weekly emails, or whether it be sharing on your socials. You know, one of the, um, I think, hurdles that I have with show growth is that the topic is about alcohol. Um, and so people are really hesitant to share because it kind of feels like, oh, hey, I'm announcing that I had a drinking problem. But that's one of the thing the reasons that I changed the name of the show from Recover with Colleen. And that's why I don't talk a lot as much about sobriety. Like sobriety is just a form of self-care. Like not drinking is as important as not sleeping. The more, the better, right? But that's why I'm changing my messaging to be um, more acceptable on a broader audience, especially because it reflects who I am in my own life. I am not in the recovery and sobriety space anymore. I am a mental health and motivation coach. And so that is my purpose with this podcast is to bring you all sorts of tools that help you expand your emotional sobriety as well as develop a growth mindset. And then all the little things that we need to know like sleep and Last week's subject where we covered ADHD and I've, we've done gut health and I have so many more awesome episodes that are coming out that I want this podcast to reach a broader audience and it's appropriate for anybody who's really 
a, even a regular drinker. And most people qualify under that. Most people are not, quote, sober. And so if you are listening and you want to support the show, find a way to share it and do some mental math in your head so that it's not an announcement of uh, an alcohol problem because it's not about the alcohol is the name of the show. <laughs> it's not about the alcohol. And being brave enough to put this out there so that other people who might be struggling with alcohol, and maybe they're not, you know, but they, the tools on this show are needed in the world. And so you can help me by helping to spread the word about this show. So I appreciate you. I'll see you next week.